Since gaining independence, the nation of Chad has seen one brutal despot after another, and one of them was Jason Habri, who seized power by force in 1982 and quickly became the architect of terrible repression in the Central African nation. The United States and France supported Habri's regime as a bulwark against Libya's Muammar Gaddafi, who wanted to expand Libya's territory into northern Chad. Under President Ronald Reagan of the United States, the CIA gave support to help Habri take power and then provided his government with massive military aid. The period when Habri was in charge of Chad was marked by terrible repression whereby opponents were arrested by his special police, tortured and often executed, including 4,000 who were identified by name. In this episode of African Biographics, we cover the dark story of Isan Habri, the butcher of Chad. Hissen Habri came from the most humble beginnings. He was born on 13 August 1942 into a family of shepherds in Chad's vast northern desert. He might never have left his local town had it not been for the French colonial administration who recognized his youthful brilliance and sent him to elite universities in Paris. There in Paris, Hissen Habri studied Marxism, mingled with other up-and-coming African students and was introduced to revolutionary politics. Around this time, Hissan Habri developed a fascination for the revolutionary Che Guevara and came to think of then Chad's president, a Christian from the south named Francois Ngata Tumbaobaye, as no more than a French puppet. The context here was that France, from its time as Chad's colonial overlord, favored the more fertile, cotton-producing southern part of Chad, known as useful Chad, over what they deemed as the dry, useless Chad of Muslim herders and nomads in the north, where Hissan Habri came from. Young Habri returned home in 1971 and dedicated himself to building a desert militia which he viewed as a power base for his much broader future ambitions. People who knew Hissan Habri from that time say that he really had a burning desire inside to conquer power. Hissan Habri's rise did not seem driven by ideology. In fact, many years later, a report from a truth commission set up in Chad sharply criticized Hissan Habri's opportunism. In this report, Habri was described as a man without scruples, motivated by power alone. He would join with the armed rebellion in Chad for one moment and with the government the next. Anyways, as he was moving from oasis to oasis in the desert, Hissan Habri governized the remote and neglected northern tribes with calls for rebellion. By the time he was 31, Hissan Habri had put together a ragtag army of several hundred men. Just like his desire to grab power, Habri also yearned to attract widespread attention to himself and his burgeoning movement. His chance to be in the limelight came in 1974 when his troops captured a French archaeologist by the name Francois Closter who was exploiting pre-Islamic tombs in the desert. Thereafter, Habri and his troops demanded a huge ransom to release this French archaeologist. When a high-ranking French hostage negotiator arrived, he too was taken prisoner and later hanged. For close to three years, the French government refused to negotiate with Habri even after Claustre's husband traveled to the region and ended up a captive himself. In this case, the French had adopted the stance of not caving to the demands of kidnappers and terrorists. Only after when French TV showed Francois Closter breaking down into tears in Nissan Habri's desert camp and having accused the French government of forgetting her, did the then French president Valéry put in steps to secure her release. The intermediary whom the French president worked with was none other than Colonel Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, Chad's northern neighbor. Muammar Gaddafi had been supporting the rebels at the time. Francois Closter was finally freed, but Nissan Habri had achieved his goal. He was now known as a force to be reckoned with. In 1973, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi sent troops into the Auzur Strip claiming that it rightfully belonged to Libya on the basis of an unratified agreement between France and Italy in 1935. Muammar Gaddafi then built an airbase at Auzur, set up a civil administration and issued maps showing the Strip as Libya's sovereign territory. Gaddafi then used the Strip as a forward base for deeper involvement in Chad. However, his occupation of the Auzur Strip caused a deep rift among the northerners in Chad. One faction was led by Gukoni Widi, who was willing to accept Libyan involvement. Another faction, which was led by Hissan Habri, adamantly opposed Muammar Gaddafi. This meant that Gukoni Widi and Hissan Habri became rivals, and their rivalry plunged the nation of Chad into prolonged conflict. With the backing of Muammar Gaddafi, Gukoni Waidi succeeded in ousting Habri from northern Chad and moved his forces southwards. 
In eastern Chad, meanwhile, Muammar Gaddafi supported a second insurgent group known as the Vulcan Army. In a joint offensive in 1978, Gukoni Wedi's forces and the Vulcan Army made a rapid thrust towards N'Djamena, the capital of Chad. The person who was leading Chad at that time, General Maloum, then called for help from the nation of France in order to fight these forces. As a result, a thousand French troops and combat aircraft were thrown into battle and routed the rebel forces on the road to N'Djamena. In the aftermath of the 1978 clashes, a new alliance was formed between General Maloum and Hissan Habri, thereby giving northerners a prominent role in the government of Chad for the first time. Since his defeat in the north, Yisan Habri had regrouped in eastern Chad, raised a new army with support from Sudan, and established a strong enough position in negotiations with General Maloum to obtain the post of Prime Minister in a new government of national unity. However, Yisan Habri soon turned on General Maloum. In February of 1979, in what became known as the First Battle of N'Djamena, Yisen Habri's forces and Maloum's national army fought for supremacy, precipitating communal violence between northerners and southerners in which thousands died. Encouraged by their leaders, southerners fled a mass southwards, leaving the administration in N'Djamena to collapse. As the cycle of revenge continued, thousands of Muslim traders in the south were killed. At a national level, Chad had no government at all. After four international peace conferences to try and remedy this state of affairs, Gukoni Wedi took over as president and Hissen Habri became the Minister of Defense. Gukoni Wedi was made president as he was regarded as a man of integrity who commanded the respect necessary to unite Chad's bitterly divided tribal factions. But it wasn't long before Hissen Habri blew up the fragile peace, triggering a civil war that lasted nine months and devastated the capital in Jamena. Half the population fled into neighboring Cameroon, leaving Jamena as a ghost city. Finally, in December of 1980, Libyan troops backed by tanks, heavy artillery, and units of the Islamic Legion combined with Gokoni Wedi's forces to drive his and Habri's fighters out of the capital, forcing Habri to seek refuge in Sudan. On the day of Habri's flight, neighbors and international news reporters found at least 50 dead bodies outside his house in Jamena, many of them with bound hands and feet. If anyone had been in doubt previously, this discovery had cemented his and Habri's reputation as a brutal man. Many people in Chad detested him for what he had done. The election of Ronald Reagan as President of the United States in 1980 would change Eastern Habri's fortunes dramatically. Ronald Reagan saw Gukoni Wedi as a stooge of Muammar Gaddafi, overlooking the fact that Libya at one time or another had backed all 11 Chadian armed factions, including that of Eastern Habri. President Reagan was encouraged in that view by members of his CIA and other members of the United States National Security Establishment who saw the Libyan troops stationed in northern Chad as a point of weakness of Gaddafi, whom Ronald Reagan liked to call the mad dog of the Middle East. Ronald Reagan and his security advisors were of the idea that if they could only find an effective ally on the ground in Chad, then they had a golden opportunity to strike a heavy blow to Muammar Gaddafi and his forces in northern Chad. So, soon after his inauguration, Ronald Reagan signed a secret presidential order to chase Muammar Gaddafi out of Chad. Ronald Reagan and his CIA became so invested in his and Habri, in fact, that even after Gukoni Wedi had Libyan forces withdraw from Chad in October of 1981, they continued to send massive quantities of cash, armaments, and vehicles to Habri through the nations of Egypt and Sudan. This support paved the way for Hissan Habri to march on to N'Djamena and claim power in June of 1982. The Organization of African Unity had peacekeeping troops in N'Djamena that were funded in part by the United States, but they put up no resistance to Hissan Habri's forces. And so that month of 1982, Hissan Habri became the leader of Chad. President Hissan Habri was not your typical African dictator. He didn't wear military fatigues as styled by Idi Amin and Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, nor did he have the pomp and flair of Mobutu Sese Seko. The new president of Chad could even appear timid in public. To win over public sympathy, he portrayed himself by turns as a convinced Maoist and also as a fervent Muslim. Once he was in power, Hissan Habri established single-party rule 
outlawed the opposition and encouraged a cult of personality. His image found its way onto t-shirts and he organized regular parades in his honor. His and Abri's speeches were filled with anti-colonialist rhetoric and he also cast himself as a populist fighter pushing back against the pressures of the West. The reality on the ground, however, was that he maintained power only by serving as a proxy for the United States and more inconsistently, French interests in the region. In return, the United States and to a certain extent the French were more than willing to turn a blind eye to the brutality with which he ran the show in Chad. The CIA in some reports even dubbed him as a moderate northerner striving to overcome his reputation for ruthlessness and opportunism. In truth, Hissen Habri's ruthlessness and brutality never subsided. In fact, it intensified. Aware that his regime was under threat from Libya and even other opposition forces in Chad, Hissen Habri created his security service known as the Directorate of Documentation and Security, the DDS, not long after becoming president. With the establishment of the DDS, Hissen Habri had what he called his eyes and ears to spy on the population, crack down on dissent and enforce loyalty through fear and division. Documents that were left behind by the DDS after Hissen Habri had been deposed highlight the extent to which Habri oversaw his day-to-day -day operations. Hissen Habri was kept informed of virtually everything to do with the DDS, from the cloth being used for uniforms as well as the deaths of prisoners. President Habri also had seven secret prisons built, including a dungeon on the grounds of the presidential palace. Almost as soon as he came to power, he was at war with the South, where opposition to him was strongest. And so Issa and Habri ordered the arrest and execution of educated Chadians from the southern cities, civil servants, teachers, businessmen, intellectuals, in the belief that such a purge was his best protection against an uprising. The list of offenses meriting arrest including speaking ill of his and Habri, listening to enemy radio stations, or performing magical rites to aid the enemy. In September of 1984, Habri induced hundreds of former southern fighters to attend a ceremony at a rural farm, where they were to lay down their arms and be incorporated into the national army. But instead, they were slaughtered along with their families in an incident that kicked off what came to be known as the Black September. One of Hissen Habri's most loyal commanders, Idris Derby, who later became the president of Chad, was put in charge of enforcing the Black September. In Hissen Habri's Chad, torture was the rule, not the exception, especially when it came to interrogating prisoners. One infamous method was known as the Abatacha and it involved tying all four limbs behind a prisoner's back. Other prisoners were subjected to water torture. I'm not going to go into further gruesome details. Ruling a country like Chad with hundreds of ethnic groups required flexibility as well as ruthlessness and Hissen Habri would periodically strike deals with ethnic leaders, rebel movements and banned political parties to bring them into his fold. Ultimately though, Hissen Habri didn't trust anyone, particularly if they were not from his own small desert Goran clan. Each of the four DDS directors who served under him were from his Goran clan with the last one of them being his nephew. Gokoni Wedi, who was still considered by many African states to be the legitimate president of Chad, posed a separate problem for Habri in the north. In 1983, he installed a rival government in Habri's own home turf and convinced the Libyans to send troops once again to support him. That in turn set off alarm bells not only in the United States but also within the French government. And so in response, the Reagan administration now made its assistance to Hissen Habri open to the public, initiating massive transfers of aircraft, trucks, jeeps, rifles, machine guns, and even missiles. The French ramped up their support too, sending mercenaries trained by their secret service to fight alongside Hissen Habri. Israel, Egypt, Sudan, and Zaire provided training and equipment of their own. All of these nations saw Muammar Gaddafi as the more consequential enemy and were worried about the havoc that he would wreak across Africa and the Middle East if he was left unchecked. They were not concerned about Hissen Habri's brutality. Saddam Hussein of Iraq was perhaps the most indulgent supporter of all, giving Hissen Habri a briefcase with a million dollars and a promise of a similar sum each year. This money was meant for Hissen Habri's personal upkeep. 
With this abundance of outside support, Hissen Habri defeated Gukoni Wedi and the Libyans on 30 July 1983. Habri's troops took between 1,000 and 2,000 prisoners and killed 200 others, including seven ministers in Gukoni Wedi's shadow government. Several weeks after this operation, the nation of France sent 3,000 troops under an operation called Operation Manta, the largest French military undertaking since the Algerian War. This operation was soon followed by Operation Epervier, in which the French air unit provided cover for Isen Habri in Jamena. The fighting would rage on and off for the next four years until Isen Habri reconquered the north of Chad once and for all in March of 1987. As time went on, Yisen Habri started becoming more and more paranoid. For example, in 1989, he accused three senior government officials representing another group of allies, the Zagawa, of plotting a coup d'etat against him. One of these officials was the head of the army, one was the minister of interior, and the third was Idris Derby, a top military advisor who had been army chief during the Black September. Immediately, Idris Derby managed to escape to Sudan, but the other two were arrested, tortured, and killed. Hisen Habri then took out his wrath on the entire Zagawa clan, raising villages and imprisoning and torturing hundreds of people. However, opposition to Habri in Chad also started intensifying. For example, in 1990, a group of intellectuals, including former government ministers, secretly distributed anti-Habri flyers at army barracks, schools, and factories around the capital. Something like this had never happened before, and it drove Hisen Habri crazy. One by one, Yisen Habri had the drafters arrested and tortured, supervising their interrogations personally. Meanwhile, in exile, Idris Derby gave the Libyans detailed information about CIA operations in Chad. Libya's Muammar Gaddafi offered Idris Derby military aid to seize power in Chad in exchange for Libyan prisoners of war. Idris Derby then relocated to Sudan in 1989 and formed the Patriotic Salvation Movement, an insurgent group supported by Libya and Sudan. This group started operations against Isen Habri. Also by this point, the French were out of the Habri business. The French had become frustrated by Isen Habri's refusal to tell them what he and the Americans were doing with a contingent of captured Libyan soldiers. The soldiers were in fact being trained as secret anti-Gaddafi contrasts. The United States, by contrast, remained fully committed, sending Yisan Habri the positions of Idris Derby's advancing troops as they sped across the flat, barren middle of the country in machine gun mounted Toyota pickup trucks. The Americans also made arrangements to fly weapons, ammunition, and other material on military transport planes so that Yisan Habri could defend the capital in Jamena. However, the sheer speed of Idris Derby's forces beat them to it. Against all odds, Isen Habri was overthrown. The night before his overthrow, Habri set about looting what remained of the national treasury, telling the central bank he needed the money to buy more weapons and defend the capital. Jamena fell to Derby's forces the next day. Afterwards, Isen Habri crossed the Chari River into Cameroon. He then fled to Senegal, taking about $12 million from the national bank accounts with him. Idris Derby's takeover of the government of Chad was not without resistance. In 1991 and 1992, there were several attacks and coup attempts by opposition forces, many of whom were still aligned with Hissen Habri, but Derby maintained his grip on the government and the country. The horrors of Hissen Habri's rule, the torture, starvation, and mass graves soon became apparent to all. Idris Derby set up a truth commission to investigate, in the name of peace and justice, his predecessor's crimes. This is when the full picture of the brutality started to emerge. For many years, Hissen Habri lived quietly in coastal Dakar, Senegal, buying properties there and remaining untroubled by the government of Abdullah Wade, which kept delaying his prosecution. Hissen Habri lived in Dakar, guarded by two security agents, and was seen occasionally at the local mosque for Friday prayers. It was the government of Wade's successor that tried Hissen Habri, setting up a special court with the African Union to do so. Yisen Habri faced charges regarding politically motivated killings and acts of torture allegedly committed during his rule in Chad. In May of 2016, Yisen Habri was found guilty by an international tribunal in Senegal of human rights abuses including rape, sexual slavery, and ordering the killing of 40,000 people. He was sentenced to life in prison. 
When Nissan Habri was convicted, his victims rejoiced, punched the air, cried, and ululated in the court. They had fought for justice for decades. Nissan Habri died on 24 August 2021 after testing positive for COVID-19. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been Tatenda for African Biographics. Until next time, cheers. Have a good one.